<laughs> we are now live on YouTube for Jenaline's class. I'm going to yes. start recording the audio for our patrons, and that's starting right now. And then we're going to go live on Instagram. Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to have you here. Jenaline is our teacher for today. <laughs> our yes. On a sunny Friday. Our lecturer. It feels like finally spring is actually maybe here. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to remind you that if you would like to download the lecture notes for Jenaline's class, mm -hmm. as well as participate in the seminar and yes. download the uh, master class video, that it can be done on Patreon. So yes. there's a link that we're going to post below. Please go over to www.patreon.com dash Jenaline and Julian. Okay, I'm now going to go live on Instagram. Checking the connection. I'm actually going to put it on you. When I like that, I think that with this angle, you can see our bikes in the back. We have <laughs> that's right. We have plans. We have after class plans. Hello, Instagram. We are now live <laughs> and about to start Jenaline's class. Yes. Class on wages and capitalism, or wages in capitalism. Yes. Or in our case, absence of wages. <laughs> Although, but it raises the question of can you have wages outside of capitalism? That's true. We're not going to talk about that. And I just want to plug very quickly, if you'd like to support our classes and keep them free forever, because that's our intention, and if you'd like to download <laughs> these study guides and the audio for these classes, plus yes. you'd like to have access to our master classes, please head over to www.patreon.com dash and Julian. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to those of you who are already patrons. Yes. Thank you very much. We are on our way to having 100 patrons, which I think is our goal for... Publishing. Well, I don't know we, if you were going to talk about that as well. Yeah, well, we lost five patrons yesterday because it was the end of the month. So those of you who were not able to join us for this month, we're sorry to see you go. We but hope that's that you're okay. in... That's okay. Yeah, no, yeah. But... We're not going to come and find you and like chase you down. That's okay. We hope that you are not... I was going to say, we hope that you're not in bad <laughs> financial situation. Yes. Um, and that we very much appreciate having had you in our classes. This is, this is the way of life. And yeah, I want to talk more about publishing because that's going to be coming up. We're mm -hmm. having a lot of talks about how that's going to work. Once we hit once we hit $1,000 on Patreon, we're going to be launching the publishing label that accompanies the Jenlene and Julian uh, I know universe. But right now we are here for Jenlene's class, and I will talk more <laughs> about that in the seminar if you want. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you know, I've wanted to... Part of the motive behind doing this class, in addition to sort of teaching economics the way I think economics could be taught and uh, bringing in topics that are often omitted in traditional economics mm -hmm. curriculum and courses, is also to do financial education. And we actually had a student who took yeah. our advice from one of the first classes, and he used it with such success I wanted to bring in a second piece of what, financial what advice. Was the first one? So the first one is if you ever have a late fee, whether it's your credit card, whether it's paying student loans, whether it's University Library. University Library, <laughs> yeah. No, whatever it is, pick up the phone, call them, wait on hold, enjoy the nice hold music that they have, and say Hi, I see that there is a late fee. Is there any way that you can reverse this fee? And almost always, I think I've, I, I'm sure that there must be a situation in which it would not work. Yeah, but I, I, I do have think, yet to hear of this. I think and the a student called them and said, "Can you reverse this late fee?" And he said that it was like a magic trick. Like he could not believe how well it worked. They're not going to interrogate you. They're not going to say, "Confess your sins. Tell us about all the times that you ate avocado toast." Like they're not going to interrogate you about whether or not you're a good person. My prejudice is that this works only if you are a nice white lady like Jenilee with a sweet <laughs> yeah, white voice, no, and that I there's mean, a certain, and that, and that this is not always true for everybody. And I think that there is probably. Um, an element of truth in that, but I don't know. Yeah, let's and, put it. Let's put it to the test. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, it's entirely possible. I mean, I think that there's a ton of stuff that I get away okay. because I have a nice smile. But <laughs> I like it. The thing here is, you're not saying that you're asking people for a favor. You're yes. saying that you're actually exerting one of your rights as a customer, which is exactly. to contest the claim. Exactly. So it's not about whether or not contest they approve. A fee. Uh, contest yeah. a fee. It's not about whether or not they approve of you. It's about taking the initiative of saying, I'm going to contest this fee. And yeah, that exactly. more often than not will actually pay off and it costs nothing. It costs nothing. Like the worst they can do is say, no, I'm sorry. And you've 
you know, you've spent a bit of time on the phone and that's, and that's to be, frustrating. To so, be so fair, like, when I, uh, I'll bet you're right, exactly. but it's a nice black like, tip works for me a lot. I love it. Like okay. politeness does go a long way, especially in customer service. And especially because you are the customer, like it's easy to forget that with, um, like, in Maybe finance. I'm just projecting my own bad customer service experiences onto like everything and everybody else. In yes, that, sense. that is true. When, I think banking in the U.S. is very different than banking in other countries. The other day, Jenlene had ordered something online. I'm sure this is something that you can relate to and decided that it needs to be returned. And it was under Jenlene's card. And so I went into the store to return this <laughs> item in question. And they wanted to see my they ID. They wanted to arrest you. They wanted to see my ID. And it's like, I'm not even buying anything. <laughs> it's not like I stole something and then decided to return it to the store. <laughs> anyway, so okay. that was I'm gonna get for us. the previous tip. So what's Julian, the second tip? I'm going to tell the second tip, but I'm gonna. it's going to be a secret. You're not going to know? I love it. <laughs> the second tip is ask for a raise. And this is one that is really, really difficult because we often feel undeserving. We often feel like we anticipate the answer, but there's absolutely zero harm in asking because in asking you are letting your boss or your supervisor or someone know that this is something that you're interested, that you're concerned about, that you're thinking about. It also signals, unfortunately, to your supervisor that you may be ready to take on additional or different responsibilities. The second tip is Here ask for a raise. Ask for a raise. Yeah, guys, we want a raise. Go to Patreon. <laughs> go over to Patreon. Go over to Patreon.com and give us a raise. <laughs> um, but that is true. You don't. You don't get it if you don't ask for it. Unfortunately. You know. So that's the first thing. But the other thing that I was going to say, and this is really, and I don't know to what extent this is unique to academia, but it can be really difficult in a job to to advance to a next position, especially in academia. So you had the experience of being a PhD student and then being employed at the university where you were a visiting lecturer, but they still saw you as a PhD student. So they were never gonna treat you as your position. And the best way to advance in the university was actually to change universities because when you sort of pivot between institutions, you're able to move up. Whereas if you stay within the same institution, you're always like, you're always going to be treated like a child. They're I, always going to have this kind of like, I knew you win. I think that's sex. true for everything in life. <laughs> when, when people start taking your position for granted, that's mm -hmm. when you are taken for granted. Mm -hmm. Although I'd, I'd go, I'd go as far as saying academia is probably one of the only work environments in which asking for things usually is just not worth it. Um, yeah. If you want something, you just have to go and take you it. You just have to apply for like it. Like those board markers, that box of board <laughs> markers that I stole from the rec room. <laughs> board markers. I'm, I'm not going to ask for <laughs> board markers. Okay, I'm going to go back to Jen Lee. Or good chalk. I remember asking for really, really good chalk. That was a serious point of contention when I taught, was not getting chalk. the cheap, cheap, scratchy chalk. Okay, High this is going to be a very brief intermission. April Fools was yesterday. Yes. Actually, yesterday. Mm -hmm. I had one of the best April Fool's joke, I think, ever when I was in high school, which is that, so I'm so old that when we were in high school, we actually had chalk. And and so what we did for April Fool's was that we got boxes of chalk, all the chalk we could see in the classroom, and we got invisible nail varnish. And we put clear. invisible nail, a clear, whatever. Invisible clear, <laughs> clear nail, nail varnish, and we put it all over the chalk. So when the teacher grabbed the chalk the next day, and put it on the board. It was like taking like a crystal and putting it on like a hard surface. Like, <laughs> no, don't, no, don't, please don't. Which I thought was a pretty good April Fool's exercise. Okay, so part two of this advice. I mean, a lot of you may not be working. Some of you may be students. Some of you may feel like you're not in a position where you can um, negotiate your salary. The second piece of advice is to ask your landlord if there's any way that you can lock in your rent rate because a lot of people mm. are facing insecure housing and uncertainty. What the landlord wants more than to charge you higher rent is to know that that apartment is going to be filled guaranteed. So if you're in a position to go to your landlord and say, is there any way that I can secure this rate of rent so you won't raise it in the coming year? It's worth just asking. Um, because that's their, that's their business is that they yeah. want a reliable landlord, especially if you've been there for a while and they, 
know you and trust you and I think, get along with the neighbors. Yeah. I think asking for things is hard in general. Yeah. I'm someone who will much rather never have to ask for help. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I think that sometimes when people are forced to ask for help, it makes them feel really frustrated. Mm-hmm. And so for me, it's less about asking for help and it's more about saying, I'd like to enter into a relationship with mm-hmm. you where mm-hmm. we have a sort of a mutual, you know, it's not just yeah. that we've paid each other. Mm-hmm, There's mm-hmm. also like something that we can do for each other. I think yeah. that that can really help sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. But if your landlord's just difficult, just, you know, I remember, I'm not, Evans. this is going to be for another time, okay. but for a while, Jen Lee and I thought about getting a dog in London. Mm. And so I started asking my landlord if we could have a dog, but then it ended up becoming a negotiation about what breed of dog, like what type of dog. <laughs> and that's when I realized like this is going nowhere. <laughs> You're not going to let your landlord pick what kind of dog you're going to get. But that's the thing is that there are certain things that your landlord cares about that you might not care about. And mm. you can use that as part of the, Yeah. you know, if you live in an apartment that allows pets, but you don't have a pet, obviously that's. But before you know it, you've got a schnauzer. And then every time you look at the schnauzer, you think <laughs> my, my landlord, landlord wanted me this, to pick the schnauzer. My landlord picked this dog. Okay. All right, let's begin this class. Let's get started. We have coffee. We have blah, blah. So wages. We're going to talk about wages and capitalism because the notion of wages outside of capitalism is kind of like it doesn't really exist. Wages are something that's really unique to capitalism. Last week we uh, I said, oh, I said that that rent and profit are two of the components of income, are two of the ways that we understand what income mm-hmm. is. The third component that I set aside for this sunny Monday is wages and wages are um, sort of technically defined as payment in exchange for labor payment in exchange for labor the idea being that you work and you receive something in exchange it can be monetary it can be a salary it can also be benefits it can be in paid time off it can be in a car it can be in other benefits but wages are essentially remuneration for work that you've put in for Mm -hmm. a job Mm -hmm. So for economics, if it's about wealth, how wealth is generated and how it's distributed, Mm -hmm. wages are a really sort of obvious and intuitive way to talk about wealth because we think about our wages as being how we generate wealth, how we... um, how we advance growth. But then the question becomes, do do higher wages reflect overall economic growth or do they come at the expense of economic growth right of course this is one of the debates over the role of inflation i don't want to get too deep into this because i want to stick with wages but the idea is that if you have wages that go up too rapidly and too broadly across the board then companies may respond by raising the price of Um, of goods and services, making things more expensive because they understand that if people are receiving a higher salary, then they have more disposable income and this may result in inflation. And that's one of the big big debates going on right now in the U.S. over the stimulus payments and, um, excuse me, other spending programs is if you increase people's disposable income Mm. and the income that they have available to pay for goods and services well that results in businesses raising their prices anticipating that people can buy more yeah in In other words will the stimmy create an (laughs) inflimmy that's what i call it can we for those for those uh, people are watching who Mm -hmm. may be younger than us or perhaps are just getting started in political economy can we give Mm -hmm. a very very brief explanation of what inflation is like two sentences because you can't Okay. No, no, because I really want to leave inflation oh, aside. Okay. It's I want to say, for the yeah, okay. no, it's not important for the argument. It's the idea that prices go up. Exactly that. Well, that your money becomes less valuable. Your money becomes less valuable. It affects how um, loans and debt is structured. Okay. It affects the relationships between debtors and creditors. I just so it's wanna, for another time. Okay. Yeah, inflation is sort of for another time because I wanna I wanna have a few other things okay. before we Fair before we go into it. Yeah, so. Um, if there were, on a different track, if there were a philosopher or a thinker who has been more detrimental to Western thought or philosophy, harmful, who has done worse things for how we conceive of the world, I would say... This is sounding very based. (laughs) Something based is coming. Yes? Malthus. Malthus? Thomas Malthus. 
who was the English philosopher, you can say, mm -hmm. who said population adjusts based on natural circumstances. And Malthus was sort of right and mostly wrong. But his idea was incredibly influential because there's an intuitive element for it. And it was actually when both Charles Darwin and the other evolutionary economist there's, whose um, name escapes me. There's a comment coming in from YouTube saying that Malthus was hella cringe. <laughs> so I think that I think that yeah. you've got support here. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely I definitely think so. Like I think that Malthus and what's funny is that he's not really taught, but his ideas were so influential. Like I would say the sort of ideology of you know, competition and fighting and war is a natural way to decrease population are so influential that it's like we don't even need to talk about Malthus anymore because his ideas have sort of been resurrected and continued in other forms. Of course, evolution is one of them. Um, this idea that competition is what um, allows for change and mutation to um, to take hold in a sense, but what where I think evolution sometimes gets Misconstrued is this notion that evolution is an advancement towards a particular life form yeah. or a particular like once we reach this place Everything will be fine. Everything will be right and that's evolutionarily. That's not true. The notion in evolution is that the ecosystem is changing, life forms are changing, there's constant changing, and there's constant, um, there's different rates of change. So for example, if you have a life form whose lifespan is just a day, it will evolve more quickly, or then a life form that has a much longer lifespan, it'll evolve more slowly. Does that sort of make yeah, sense? Yeah, no, I mean, and so the differing rates of evolution will is what keeps it constantly don't in even, flux. Don't even get me started on evolution, because like for me, <laughs> Evolution, I talk a lot about the necessity of contingency. Mm -hmm. And so when mm -hmm. we talk about evolution as being the survival of the fittest, right. we actually misrepresent what that process is. Yeah. Because, and this is, you and I were talking about this yesterday. Mm. When you measure something, mm -hmm. you're creating something. Mm -hmm. So we have this idea that when you measure something, you're just measuring something objectively that, exists. that exists <laughs> in the world. But the act of measurement mm -hmm. creates that which is measured and thought in a certain way. Right. And so when we start doing that with evolution, mm -hmm. we start creating patterns of purpose yeah. within and nature mm -hmm. that don't necessarily exist. Mm -hmm. So we're basically retroactively imposing necessity on contingency. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that evolution doesn't exist. Don't right, get me right, wrong. Right. I'm not a creationist. But mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that the mechanism of evolution has less to do with the survival of the fittest mm -hmm. and more to do with the way in which contingency becomes formalized into a form of necessity. Yeah. 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 Anyway, no, that's really, that, no, no, like, that's no. A, that's really well put. Um, so that's so I think that's sort of widely acknowledged in debates and discussions about evolution. But it's also prevalent in in economics unfortunately there's this notion in economics that there are the natural rates of something there's a natural rate of unemployment there's a natural mm -hmm. rate of inflation there's a natural rate of of wages and i think that this is a i think that this is also a malthusian influence right. by way of classical economics which said that 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 wages are the result of uh, supply and demand coming together and either being above or below, but trying to find that natural rate. And if only we could get to that natural rate, then everything would be fine. And the preoccupation in economics that I think I'm most critical of is this is this obsession with equilibrium, this notion that if only we could get to the equilibrium balance, the natural rate, mm -hmm. then the economy would just hum along, you know? And it's the, it's the equivalent, I think, of um, someone saying, well, evolution, evolution tells us that if only there were the perfect species of everything, everything would be in balance, nature would be in harmony, and we could just freeze everything and everything would be fine and everything would be self-sustaining. And that's not how that's not how biology works. That's not how evolution works. And I think that's not how economics work. But well, that is that's that's the influence of how it's taught. Yeah, there's something really and this is something I might do in my class, mm -hmm. I'm really interested in is how when we're trying to come up with like a natural formula, like a mm -hmm. measurement for what's considered natural, unnatural. Mm -hmm that we have these blind spots that are really revealing, like in a very like sort of Hegelian Marxist sense that mm -hmm. like the excessive thing, the thing that we can't symbolize mm -hmm. in a structural sense tells the truth of the situation. Mm -hmm. And the concrete example of that that I just found out about is that in the United Kingdom, when you're talking about what is the relationship between a miscarriage 
and a uh, stillbirth. Hmm. But, and I, I might be getting these wrong, but it's so okay. there's basically a cutoff where they say either you've miscarried or they say you've lost the child. Mm. It's considered like mm. a life. <laughs> and apparently there's no national standard in the United Kingdom for that. So depending on if you get, cl- but it is recorded in the official records. Right, medical so records. depending on the clinic or the midwife or the doctor. Depending on if you're in London or in mm. Manchester, there will be a different terminology used to measure the validity of the life being lost. And of course that has enormous impact on the mourning process and the grieving of the Absolutely. parents because to say that you had a miscarriage mm-hmm. is one thing. I mean, it's horrible, but then to say that you lost a child is a very different way of designating it. Yeah. And the funny thing is that in that case, you can really see that the measurement of it right. doesn't reflect a natural process. It's specifically a human subjective process. And I think that's kind of what you're hinting at here, which is that there's points within the measurement of economics where we have like a nodal point where mm-hmm. we don't know exactly how to measure it. And that's an important part. Yeah, and more than that, I'm saying that the preoccupation with trying to find the natural rate presupposes that once we're at that natural rate, like if only we could get all the numbers just right, everything would be fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. And not only can we never get the numbers just right, the notion that there is a right number is is totally, totally futile. But I think that that's part of the reason that mainstream economics goes down this route of having all these models is because they say, if only we could find the equilibrium, if only we could find the point of balance. Um, but anyone who's ridden a bicycle, see, you know, back of the, behind the car, anyone who knows has ridden a bicycle understands that balance and equilibrium is not mm. based on being stationary, but actually based on momentum. <laughs> nice. So, that was so wise. <laughs> that was great. That was like, I don't know. That was like leveling up wisdom. Yeah. You I wondered why I had the bicycles on the back of the car. No, that was just great. <laughs> I feel I'm like a little you. grasshopper now. That was so great. <laughs> I'm going to start saying that to people. <laughs> okay. So that's wages as reflecting supply and demand leading to a natural level and sort of my problem with the natural level in economics. But my other problem is with supply and demand itself because economic, I mean, if you do any economics course, one of the first things they're going to teach you is supply and and demand curves. And unfortunately, they say, well, supply is a function of demand and demand is a function of supply and a couple of other elements. But they don't get into what those other elements are. And the crucial thing that gets missed in economics is what composes, I mean, what drives supply and demand? What what brings those forces into being that they become such a tautology? And this is where I think political economy is really important because political economy says, Those forces are really a result of social, of personal, of behavioral, of political influence. A really good a really good example of how that is political economy was Mm -hmm. if you look at what happened in Germany in the past couple of days. Because for Easter, Mm -hmm. the German government announced that they were gonna have a so called Ruhe Tag or a rest day. So Mm -hmm. they were basically going to extend Easter by one day Mm -hmm. and shut everything down. And since then, they've reversed it because people freaked out Mm -hmm. and they realized that it wasn't worth that one day. Mm -hmm. However, the key question here was, do we close supermarkets? Because if you close supermarkets, it's not that there's a shortage of anything. Mm -hmm. It's not like people are going to die of hunger, but suddenly there's a rush to the short supermarkets. And so the process of announcing a one day closure of the supermarket will create an artificial shortage because people will start create an artificial surge a people. demand exactly yeah. artificial mm-hmm. demand which could then generate the very thing that didn't exist before yeah and it's like the problem from hell and it's for me it's like a really nice way to put it and that's what that was um also Keynes's insight with economics is he said economics isn't just about um formulas it's also about it's not just about economic reality it's also about people's experience of it and their anticipations yeah. so if the government announces a policy then how do people react or businesses react in anticipation of that policy being yeah. implemented yeah that's really important which is awful because in a sense like it would be easier if everyone yeah, it's were really just perverse. It's yeah really right perverse. like that's the hard thing about yeah. about this it's like and to go well, back what to the, what the government point. what the government really ought to do is just every day announce a mandatory closure and then just not do it so that people become numb to the fact that like the government is i think that's not already happened 
mean, that's already happened. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think that would that would help the government's case. So, so the other aspect of this this um, supply and demand curve on wages is that when you take a case like unionization, which which says a group of people bargaining, you. Know, you know, engaging in collective bargaining for for higher wages will will shift the the supply the the demand curve of wages for the company, and it'll mean that there's a whole strata of people who suddenly have lower incomes. This is on a supply and demand curve. Like this is what happens. The empirical reality is the complete opposite, which is why, you know, you have a country like France, the rate of unionization is incredible. It's like 20%. It's extremely low. We have this bias that unionization is massive in France, and of course it is. But part of the reason that unionization is so important in a country is not just because um, it in it increases wages for employees. Mm. It increases wages for people in other industries because the unions set the standard for what wages, benefits, healthcare, other services, etc., are in that area. And researchers have found that if uh, a company unionizes, especially a relatively large one, that actually can <clears throat> excuse me, that actually drives up the wages in the surrounding community. So at the moment, their um, votes are being counted for unionization of the Amazon, Amazon Warehouse right, yeah. and Bessemer. Yeah, and so what I think is important to, to see about unionization as an example is that this is a, this is a sample of, this is a, an example of where um, the model predicts that unionization will result in lower wages, but the empirical evidence says that's actually not the case. The mm. opposite happens. So rather than question the model, economists unfortunately have said, well, that just shows that unions are a bad thing and we, we just shouldn't have them and, right. and, and, and workers shouldn't unionize. Um, and if I can just like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm gonna, leave, I'm gonna leave wages. Right. I'm gonna leave unions aside. I'm gonna leave unions aside. Uh, um, but that plays into the notion of uh, minimum wage, of course, because there's a debate in the United States about whether or not minimum wage should be raised. And as a matter of fact, it has stayed at around seven dollars since I think 2009 was the last time that it was that it was raised. Um, and there's a lot of really good stuff that's been written about the minimum wage. Um, but one of the things that is really important about minimum wage is that it, like union bargaining, sets the standard, it sets the industry standard. Right, right. So even if people are not working for minimum wage, their salary may be tied to minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So part of the problem in the United well, States... Back, yeah, yeah. That goes back to the idea that when we measure something, it's not objective. It mm -hmm. creates the reality around us by exactly. means of setting a measurement. Yeah, no, then this is a perfect example. Wages are a perfect example. Um, the other thing that supply and demand has trouble capturing that has become really important is uh, wage inequality. And this is, I mean, I should probably do inequality in its own class because there's a lot to say about it and there's a lot of really interesting um, research about it. Um, but one of the drivers for inequality is the relationship between productivity and wages. So one of the um, interesting phenomena over the last, you know, and I thought it was since the 1970s, but this actually goes back to the 1940s and the 1950s in the United States, that productivity has more than doubled, which means that the sort of the amount of work that can be completed by an employee in the, a fixed particular amount of time has risen dramatically, but wages have not kept pace. And you see this when you adjust again for inflation, which is why measuring, which is why inflation is so important. And what's for, also important, yeah. I mean, what's complicated about inflation is how do you measure inflation? Is it the price of you know coffee going up? Is it the price of rent going up? Is it the price of university tuition going up? And of course, university tuition, housing, these things are excluded from measuring inflation. So the things that have become the most expensive and that constitute a big, the biggest yep. part of yep. people's payments you want to know funny are not are excluded from inflation measurement. Yes. You want to know a funny example? Yes. So my big pet peeve about that is GDP mm -hmm. and like how wrong GDP is. So mm -hmm. here's here's the deal. If you have a teacher mm -hmm. who's teaching a student to go and have a job that is well paid, yeah. that is not accounted 
into GDP. If you took that teacher and you put that teacher in prison, mm. that would raise the GDP because the labor that the prisoner would produce in prison mm -hmm. would be counted towards GDP. Yeah. So, like, that's how, like, messed, to, like, put it really starkly, how messed up the GDP is. You know, that's a is. really famous quip by, I'm trying to remember who the economist was, who said, if you want to, if you want to decrease GDP, or if you want to increase GDP, divorce, you, divorce your wife yeah. and make her your housekeeper. And the, and the, the sort of, um, Sexist assumption, of course, is that women do domestic work, and if they're married, they do it for free, well, and if they're not married, they get paid to do it. It's funny that you mentioned productivity yeah. in relation to that. Yeah. Because, and I'm taking all these examples from a New Yorker <laughs> piece that I read. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, like, suddenly some, like, <laughs> measurement guru. Julian studied. I mean, yeah, I've been studying up on this. So, it's really, well, I love it because philosophy leads me in one direction, mm -hmm. and this opens my mind to other yeah. things. So, mm -hmm. talking about productivity and gender for right. a moment. Mm -hmm. So... What happens is that in a lot of countries, especially in the developing world, uh, women will do a lot of labor in the home. Mm -hmm. So this will be like, you know, they're, they're weaving something to sell at the market. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't necessarily counted as productivity. Now, the reason it wasn't was that the forms, the census forms, where you had to list your profession, mm -hmm. only had primary occupation. But of course, increasingly, and this is true in our studies as well, mm -hmm. people don't just have a primary occupation, they have multiple sources of income. And so if you put only primary application, what it means is that women will not put their secondary or tertiary mm -hmm. or even quadrupliary <laughs> income because women are yeah. working all these jobs, especially mm -hmm. in developing countries. And as soon as you change that census question towards mm -hmm. what's your secondary mm -hmm. job, mm -hmm. suddenly productivity almost doubles. It went up by like a third in a lot of developing countries. So like, That's really again, the measurement yeah. will change what we think the reality is. Yeah. And productivity has always been kind of a flawed yeah. Oh, yeah. measurement. I mean, uh, yeah. The, the graph someone should make is that while productivity <laughs> went, uh, what is it, down or up? Up. Up. In sync with productivity going up, amount of minutes, YouTube videos about procrastination went <laughs> up as well. Okay, sorry. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got one of those, like, auto-suggest pages while I was working the other day that was, like, a BBC article about procrastination. And I, I felt kind of offended, frankly. I felt judged. You felt judged? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, we can do the philosophy of procrastination another time. I'm actually pro-procrastination. <laughs> I mean, most people, when they talk about procrastination, they mean anti-crastination, basically. <laughs> like, it's one of those weird, like, oxymoronic statements where against procrastination, you know what I mean? Like, cancels each other out. Yeah, but productivity is a really important metric, and I think part of the reason that the business community is so, and economics are so preoccupied with it is because it's, like, the measure of how good you are at your job. It's, like... It's it's taking, um, it's taking a normative judgment on someone's yeah. work, and it's quantifying that in how how valid are you as an employee? How mm. worthwhile is your contribution yeah. to this project? Um, well, the idea of productivity is become social. It's for another time, but it's become so socially ingrained as like a moral, ethical, personal responsibility. Exactly. Going back to the idea of like Weber's Protestant mm -hmm. yeah, work, ethic work ethic and all of that, all that and that. Yeah. That we've been trained that when we're not doing something that we quantify it in terms of financial productivity, mm -hmm. we're somehow thinking like we're not doing something valid. And yeah. so for me, actually, part of leading a free life mm -hmm. is actually forcing yourself to do things yeah. that can't immediately be quantified as being productive. Yeah. And I think that the part of the part of the challenge also in talking about inequality, and you touched on this a little bit, mm -hmm. is the gender dynamic, but of course also the race dynamic. Oh yeah. And I was looking at one of the things that I put in the lecture notes was um, notes about the book Where Do We Go From Here, which is Martin Luther King Jr.'s fourth and final book. Where do we go from here? We should do a t-shirt that says Where Do We Go From Here? <laughs> um, and one of the things that I think often gets omitted from Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy mm -hmm. I mean, he's, uh, of course, he was a civil rights champion, but I think you have to see his work as a civil rights leader in the context of worker rights and worker dignity. And um, uh, I think that one of his first big marches was for the sanitation workers in Alabama. And he was, re he really understood that racism, I mean, structural racism wasn't just a political issue, it was also an economic issue. 
And it's incredibly depressing to reflect on the fact that wage inequality between similar white workers and similar black workers yeah. is unchanged since that time. And to me, what that says is that civil rights isn't just a project of voting rights, enfranchisement, and political participation, but it's also about economic participation because the U.S. has a really unfortunate history, even in progressive institutions, of very overt racism. What I mean by that is um, under the New Deal, for example, black Americans were excluded from benefits that white Americans received. This was housing, this was the GI Bill, this was college education, this was university tuition, this was huge financial opportunities, home ownership that are the basis for white wealth generations later. And that was denied to black Americans under Roosevelt's New Deal. So while we can see Roosevelt as like a progressive who did a lot of wonderful things for social spending, we have to acknowledge that there is a racist, um, not even undertone, but there was overt racism in who, who could benefit from these programs. The other um, aspect of that is the racism of unions that, that denied opportunities to black Americans who moved north to Detroit and other industrial cities um, and, and were excluded I mean, or kept in low-level jobs. And it's not yeah. even like historic because if you think about it, um, one of the problems when it comes to poverty in mm -hmm. the United States is the percentage of income that people have to sp spend on their mm -hmm. rent. Mm -hmm. And so it's calculating the United States that you should spend about like an upper limit would be 30% of your income right. on rent. Mm -hmm. And when we look at African-American communities, it tends to be 60%. And so what that does is when you go from 30 to 60% of your income mm -hmm. being spent on rent, mm -hmm. it puts you in that precarious position where all it takes is a little push or a little yeah. nudge and you suddenly can't pay for your meds or you get evicted. And so what, what happens there is that becomes an invisible form of precarity mm -hmm. because you're constantly living on that line of when is the thing going to happen that's going to wreck me. And so, yeah. and that's something that continues to this day. Like the, the, the racial disparity between the percentage of income that goes into rent mm -hmm. is so, it's like double basically. Yeah. And that, and that's not just for rent, but if you have cities that are zoned and retailers understand this, this is really important for retailers because they, um, they recognize that um, insurance premiums may be higher in more diverse neighborhoods, for example, which is why if you go to a grocery store in a predominantly black or minority community, groceries will be more expensive because it's more expensive for the grocery store. And that's not because that's not supply and demand. <laughs> that is racism. <laughs> like well, that is so. It's funny because, well, yeah, I mean. I don't want to get into the woods here, but like at what point do we take something that's an economic principle or mm -hmm. an unacknowledged principle and we start describing it as racist? That's also a difficult process. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, but I can also just say like I think it's racist. I think like, that's, that's my <laughs> that's my personal that's my personal opinion. Sure, but I mean Yeah. I, I want to take credit for the fact that I linked rent to wages and wages to rent. I thought yeah. that was like the bridge I was trying to create for I you. I thought that was excellent. Yeah, I no, just I'm, like I'm tooting my own horn here. No, I'm very, very, very grateful. I mean, it's interesting because I grew up on the, I mean, grew up as a, is, mm -hmm. I'm overstating it here. I lived in the United States until I was seven years old. Mm -hmm. So the first seven years of my life were spent in the United States on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And the communities that I lived in were um, very mixed. Yeah. So I lived in a Hasidic area, part of town. Mm -hmm where there are many Jews mm -hmm. and Orthodox Jews, mm -hmm. especially. But in my school, I was in the minority as being a white kid. Mm -hmm. It was majority African-American. Mm -hmm. uh, Mar it was the um, Martin Luther King Jr. public high. And that experience for me, like I was aware of race from mm -hmm. a very young age, like, mm -hmm. you know, literally saying, why does this kid have different hair than me, etc. Mm -hmm. Moving over here to Washington, I'd never been in a place in my life, including in the United Kingdom, that was so predominantly white. And so I think that my conception of racism yeah. has also changed because there is, I always thought that racism was about, are you racist towards somebody? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I came here and I realized that if anything, it's more racist here, mm -hmm. but there's less black people. And that's something that I, and in the same way that sometimes the people have the strongest opinion about immigrants are the people who live furthest away from the border. And that's, that yeah. because I grew up in a, I grew up in a part of the country where there was definitely racism. I'm not saying there wasn't, but like. I well, would, here there's yeah. fewer opportunities, let's say, for racism to manifest. 
You know what you've done but, now, which is that your seminar is just going to be only questions yeah, about racism, right? No, like, this and is that's, the, this is... that's fine. Well, I just want to say, I mean, this is just a plug to say, if you haven't read anything by Martin Luther King Jr., he's very much worth reading. And there are a number of his speeches online, including, I think, one of his last ones, which was made in Detroit. I think it's called The Two Americas. And it is, he is... He's just a really wonderful moving speaker. And if you haven't had a chance to listen to an entire speech, I highly recommend that sometime this weekend you take an hour because his speeches are like, they're... The oration is They're robust. Yeah. yeah, and it's really interesting listening to him. He has... It's... Yeah. I highly recommend that. And... <laughs> I Sorry. love that Jolly's recommendation is listen to Martin Luther King Jr. That's, okay. Like yeah, it. because he is, I mean, he should be recognized as an economist in a sense. No one's going to say Malcolm he, X here. It is, a, it is an economic project. Yeah, you know, you can listen to Malcolm X too. Okay. <laughs> two white That's people have week. identified the two most week. prolific African-American historical figures. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I'm going to stop making fun of myself. I'm, I'm <laughs> pleased you. that you brought up this topic. Yeah. So that leads to another question about unemployment itself. If we're going back to the supply mm -hmm. and demand curve, is unemployment a choice? Because the supply and demand curve says, well, people just aren't finding jobs at a price point that's appropriate. We hear this all the time, especially in light of the stimulus. People saying... Stimmy. Not gonna say it. People saying, you know, I really would like to hire some employees, but you know, they'd rather stay on unemployment. They're getting the stimulus, so they don't really need to come in and work for me. If you're saying that, you have failed economics. What that means is that the salary that you are offering is too low and you need to raise the salary expectations for your job. Like employers who are complaining about not being able to find qualified employees are undervaluing their employees. I mean, think about it when you when you go to a store and say, I have you know, I have one penny and I want to buy an apple and you know, I just can't find a good quality apple for one penny. Well, the problem isn't about the availability of apples. The problem is your expectation about what you can buy with a penny. And employers are doing the exact same thing when they're undervaluing their employees and saying, how come I can't find good employees who are willing to work for me for... Your seminar is just going to blow up. You're being so based right now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I love it. Sorry. I'll try and rein it in. <laughs> no, so anyway... Great. I really like like it. No, I I like hearing this. Like I, I I'm I'm a hundred percent like I'm like gently and go. I'm just saying if you want to <laughs> No, you I really give don't want to. No, I really don't want but to. But you do a good job of it. Um I mean I I don't want to be polemical and I don't wanna be like I don't wanna be like starting fights because the internet scares you're, me. You're not being I don't think you're being polemical as such. <laughs> okay. I think you're saying what you're trying to argue here, as far as I understand it, is that yes. the primary complaint of business owners is that the they struggle to find skilled workers. Yeah. Now, I think that there is some truth to that problem from what I've heard from people, which is that it's just hard to find talent in yeah. general. But what you're saying is that if you take that argument, mm -hmm. which is the I can't find good people, and you use that to justify artificially keeping salaries low, right. that's a form of bad faith. That's yeah. a disingenuous argument. Yeah, absolutely. I'm thank like you. your lawyer here. Thank you for thank you for restating that. So <laughs> the other thing that happens when um, people, the other, I mean, it's also important to acknowledge why people may not work. And an important one, of course, is providing childcare. If you can't afford childcare services because it's really expensive, if schools are closed, if facilities are closed, and you need to stay, stay home to take care of your children, then there are going to be fewer employment opportunities available to you. And that's not because you choose not to work. It's because there aren't options that are available to you. And in communities where more childcare facilities become available, people actually work more and are more likely to work more hours because the truth is people like to work. People like to do something productive with their life. They want to have meaning. They want to have community. They want to have, you know, colleagues they can complain about. They want to have, you know, we want to have that interaction. We want to feel like we're providing for our families, like we're working, like we're doing something. That is important to all people, but it's about having employment with dignity that's really important. So what I'm suggesting in this class is that this supply and demand curve of employment is not only useless, it is misleading about how it frames 
the relationship between wages and employment, between wages and equality, between wages and um, um, other things. Is there going to be a day where there's going to be a baby in the back seat here during these lectures? Like, that would be so funny. It'd be hilarious if we did that. And, like, over the years, like, you just saw the kid growing up. That would be so funny. That's great. A bit dystopian. Uh, a bit dystopian. Um, so, all of that aside, all of that discussion about supply, supply and demand... Babies. Babies. All of that stuff aside. We have to take a step back and say, what actually are we assuming when we talk about wages? What are the assumptions that are made about our economic and social system? And this is the stuff that's really interesting for me. Because this is where Marx, of course, says what what makes it so that earning a wage becomes logical. Okay. No, I've got plenty. I just need to like... Not, not spill coffee on myself while I'm gesticulating. Yeah, I gotta put my coffee down to talk about Marx. We have articulation so. and we have gesticulation <laughs> and then we have flatulation. <laughs> Just saying. These are the three modes of expression in the car. <laughs> you know, there was a bit, there, we get comments every once in a while which is like, I, I hate Jenna Leeds laugh. Laughter <laughs> makes me sick. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> It's like, I just love that. I love that, like, when you give like an hour long lecture, like, the problem people have is like your laugh. <laughs> that to me is like sexism in a nutshell. It's like, here's a woman who's talked for an hour, but man, she laughs too much. <laughs> I also love that your laugh is never to like make other people feel good. Your laugh is always like slightly like, like, I'm enjoying myself. Uh, exactly. Like, I love your laugh. I, I'm glad you do. Recorded. I'm glad you do. Um, I want to talk about... Um, so Mark says we have to look at the two components of wages, which is time and labor. How do we actually construct time and how do we construct labor? So for time, I want to go back to one of the opening scenes of the movie Parasite. Oh, yeah, where the Parasite. family is sitting together in the home. And the rich family or the poor family? The poor family oh, yeah. is sitting together in the home, folding pizza boxes. <coughs> oh, yeah, I remember that. And they're watching this YouTube video. They're streaming the video of someone showing how quickly you can fold up the, t yeah, the yeah, pizza yeah. boxes. And they're just in awe of this person who can, like, whip together all these boxes. And then <clears throat> the pizza store employee comes and picks up all the boxes. And she's like, these are not folded right. These are not usable. And they're just trying to, like, please, anything you can give us, we're grateful for. This is an example of non-wage labor. This is an example of, um, like, homework. Not school I feel homework, like, yeah, but, um... like, work that is done in the home. And this used to be ubiquitous and is still quite common especially in developing countries it's really common with textiles with um crafts with food um, pizza boxes assembly. well that's pizza actually boxes. you know i'm joking yeah, here, but yeah. actually as like food delivery becomes like such a huge business mm -hmm. we've also seen an explosion of that kind of thing and yeah. proof of this mm -hmm. anecdotal proof is that i keep getting youtube ads where there's like a young woman who says i kept thinking to myself how can i make money online mm -hmm. first of all i'm like how do they think this is me? Don't they see I have a super successful Patreon with 67 <laughs> patrons? Anyway, and so the video, the, the video is saying, I was asking myself, how can I make money online? Yeah. And then I realized that I could do curbside delivery. Mm -hmm. And so they deliver it to her and then she delivers it to somebody else's curb. Do you see what I mean? So it's like, that's exploding right now. That kind yeah, of thing. I mean, and it's really, really interesting because because this goes back to what you were talking about of multiple jobs. It's not enough side to just hustle. have a job. Yeah, you gotta have a side hustle. You gotta be doing something. My else. side hustles have you, side hustles. <laughs> you gotta be maximizing your productivity. You gotta be constantly working. You gotta put your home at work for you. You gotta rent out your car while you're not driving it. You gotta rent out your home while you're not using it. You gotta rent out, you know, whatever. I'm to, gonna rent out the lower maximize. half of my body while I'm. Oh, sorry. Mm, yeah. <laughs> to maximize your income. Sorry, I'm interrupting you. I'm, sorry, podcast listeners. You're, you practice for when there's a baby in the backseat. I am the baby in the backseat. <laughs> Let it be known. As Colin Powell said, after the Iraq war, I sleep like a baby, which means I wake up at 2 a.m. screaming for my mother. 
it's so dark. I actually Did love. He, really say he that? said that. I actually love Colin Powell. Like I know that we're supposed to hate him, but like I actually kind of love Colin Powell. Well, he's right that sleep like a baby is a bit. Well, he was asked something about do you how sleep do you like sleep, how, how do you sleep at night? Exactly, yeah. something like that. It was great. Okay, so that is so piece work is this notion of like working at home, assembling, doing handy hand handcrafts, handy work. Yeah. I always have to be sort of careful with this. I once saw a great translation uh, in Turkey of uh, like a hand, handicraft market that said hand jobs, and I just <laughs> I love that translation. Um, hand jobs. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's sort of where. Um, Your class where is so domestic funny. Was dom- <laughs> that's just because I laugh a lot. Domestic work was at, in a feudal system as well as under capitalism. But what you notice with the family in Parasite mm. is that they're just trying to do it as fast as they can because they realize the more boxes they do, the more money they're going to make. And this leads us to the transition of hourly wages. As soon as you, are, you can no longer measure work in pieces produced... Right. It becomes normal to say, well, it took you, you know, an hour to assemble a thousand boxes. Therefore, I'm not going to I'm not going to worry about how many boxes you folded. I'm just going to worry about the number of hours. And mm-hmm. if your rate is becoming too low, then I'm going to fire you. So this transition from work by number of pieces or um, output to hours is really really significant um a key example from i think marx uses it or other marxists have referred to it is also the notion that our social conception of how time is measured was really strongly affected by capitalism and a great example of this is the transition from water mills and water dams to the internal combustion engine because of course the the industrial revolution is what is attributed to which is attributed the rise of capitalism this notion that we couldn't have capitalism without the industrial revolution is really puzzling for economists and for historians especially because they say well the industrial revolution wasn't really quite as significant as it's made out to be. If you actually look at what was happening, most of it was, yeah, the development of some new technologies, but they weren't widely adopted. It was really unreliable. Stuff was breaking down constantly. It was expensive to get materials. It was expensive to find technicians. Like, it was not very reliable, and it, was some, it wasn't something that was really widely adopted. Wait, but imagine, I, feel like, I feel like you're just dropping, like, a really big argument here. You're saying the Industrial Revolution is overrated? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. But what is not overrated about the Industrial Revolution is this notion of going from natural time (coughs) to quantified time. Okay. So what I mean by natural time is if you... Sleep Let's say you have a flour mill. You live on a river. You live on a river and you grind flour for a living. And when the water level is high, you can run the mill and you can grind a lot of flour and you can be really productive. But when the water level's low, nothing can happen. You're just sitting around waiting, and that's fine. Sometimes you're busy, sometimes you're less busy. It's not about productivity. It's not about work hours. You know, the lull gives you an opportunity to work on other things. You're not concerned about when your mill is not running. But suddenly, if we go to, like, an internal combustion engine, which can run perpetually, it can run 24-7, you can always have people working on it, then you have this notion of like anything can be done at any time and suddenly a whole new possibilities open up in terms of employment and you can have little children in factories working 16 hour days but right yeah which but you can't I, have with a mill yes okay i'm not gonna go too like we can talk about this in the seminar yeah this is actually where i push back a little bit because i it's not even about saying oh the industrial industry brought us a lot like mm-hmm. I don't think that it's a divide between we have Hobbit, the mm-hmm. Shire yeah, before, yeah. and then we suddenly have like the automation. No, no, for sure. Of, like, I actually think that in a lot of ways life gets better with the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, I don't think course. any of us would want to go back to a pre-industrial. The point is you don't have a choice. Once you go from piecework mm-hmm. to wages, you can't go back to piecework. 
you can't go back to just assembly boxes. And that's what's in Parasite. Once they go from piecework to service work and being paid by the hour, and it's not even like, it's not even like they're doing a lot in Parasite. What's be, what they're being paid to do is to be there, to be available, to help, to do anything that needs to be done, whether it's totally demeaning work. Yeah, I it's mean, the uh, availability of time. It's the ownership of time. It's no longer the ownership right. of things. And that's why it's significant as Parasite. It's because it's going from piecework. It's going from the home labor to service of your time is now owned by someone else. Well, I think it's wrong to suggest that one is better than the other or yeah, worse than the course. other. But I do agree with you that like the when time becomes a commodity mm -hmm. and the time is your time to be sold, right. that that's a, that's a shift. It's like... um. Used to be these old Soviet posters that would say, like, even your sleep belongs to the company. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, this idea that everything you have should be quantified and given. Right. Um, in a sense. And I'm saying that that's one directional. Once you go from homework right. to wage labor, you can't shift back to piecework. You can use piecework to supplement your income. You know, you can set up an Etsy store. You can you know, make crafts and sell them online. But once you go to a system that is wage labor, you can't move away from that. That's that's the point. It's not about one is better or worse than the other, but it's an ideological transition from one to the other that m prevents us from being able to go back. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is that this notion that you can sell your labor as a commodity. And this is... Marx's other insight, of course, is because Marx is looking at the system of capitalism and saying, you know, why are people flocking to these dirty, crowded cities to work in these awful factories where they're, you know, barely paid a subsistence wage? Like, how is that a choice? How is it that you are, that you're confronted with this horrible situation and yet people are flocking to the cities? So he looked at other forms of other modes of production like feudalism and slave societies and he said there's always sort of a let's say a, an ideological structure that gives shape to the incentives for people to participate in the economy and drive that participation and it's usually some sort of force or some sort of coercion um well, but in capitalism it's not obvious yeah go ahead yeah i mean that's really important if you're going to join my next class yeah uh next monday this is what we're going to talk about is the relationship between coercion and mm -hmm. consent mm -hmm. consensus <laughs> because one of the things that capitalism does and when you talk about industrial revolution yeah. i also think to me is like the rise of also parliamentary systems mm -hmm. and the idea of democratic representation yeah. one of the things that democratic representation does is it says you chose us yes we're here because you gave us license if to there's be here. anything wrong you only have yourself to blame and, and this is a really really important point and it's the yeah. opposite of like parental authority mm -hmm. because when you're a kid you look at your parents and you say i didn't choose to be here mm -hmm. you made me right so i can in a sense like disavow a, disavow this whereas in a democratic society and mm -hmm. especially in a capitalist democratic society the yeah. idea is that you don't complain because this is a system that you chose. Exactly. You gave us the monopoly of power. You chose to be exploited. Now you have to like that process. And this is why the ideology of freedom and economics is for me so painful is because it's not, it's not freedom. It's a forced choice because as soon as you remove people's alternative options for how to provide for themselves, of course they're going to go to factories because they have no alternative. There is no other option. There are no, you know, there are no longer commons available for them. There are no, no longer, you know, homework or um, piecework. Homework. Sorry. Homework. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know. It's either hand job or homework. Like it's just, there's so many minefields. <laughs> linguistic minefields and describing this. This is no longer a PG class. <laughs> um, and uh, and so the, the so we have to create the the discourse of freedom in order to justify this economic system. Well, it's so, a double-edged sword. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is actually going to drop us right into next week's class because we've talked about rent last week. Mm -hmm. We've talked about wages this week. So next week we're going to talk about profit. And this is really where where Marx's ideas become, I think, really useful in talking about um, where wealth is generated. Because for the classical economists and even the neoclassical economists, they say, you know, as long, you know, there's rent plays a role and wages play a role. And as long as there's economic growth, everyone's going to benefit. Things are going to be fine. But of course, 
you know, we're not we're not seeing that we're we're confronted with a different reality and so marx's challenge is to say first of all why are people compelled to work for wages mm -hmm. and where does this profit come from where does this surplus capital come from so that's what we're going to talk about next week but right now we are going to hang up we're going to say goodbye we're going to say thank you very much for joining us and we're going to jump onto clubhouse that's right if you want to join our seminar and you'd like to uh, challenge Jelene on her yes, arguments or contribute or uh, whatever, ask us questions or ask Jelene questions, you can head over to our... <laughs> or just make me laugh. Yeah, or just make Jelene laugh. <laughs> um, you can go to our clubhouse. Uh, my handle is at Sublime Hysteric. Jelene's handle is at Jelene. But you can also find it, the learning community. Or the club, the learning community. Now, yeah. the room that we're going to open on Clubhouse is going to be under your name or under my name? I think it's under the learning community. We're still trying no, no, to no, figure no, no. out. This is, so this is important. We can okay. do three things. We can open it in the learning community, or we can open it for me, or we can open it for you. I was going to say... I think we should open it under my name, because that's okay. where we have the most followers. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. So if you go to at Sublime Hysteric on Clubhouse, yes. or you can eavesdrop in on the Discord, Discord because yes. we have a Discord voice channel where you can listen and ask questions... Um, and also, if you'd like to thank Jeline for this wonderful class <laughs> and for the labor of producing <laughs> this session, please head over to our Patreon, where starting at just $5 a month, you can support our classes and have access to a whole range of perks and benefits. And I was going to say, on Discord, we're also going to be doing a reading group on Sunday. Easter, Easter Sunday. Sunday, that's right. Julian is going to be leading a discussion on... Zizek's... Yeah, I'm we're, so we're launching our book group. Yes. And so on Discord this Sunday, I'm going to be giving a Discord exclusive introductory talk mm -hmm. to Zizek's The Ticklish Subject, yes. which we're going to be reading in the book group. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to join that exclusive Discord talk discussion, <laughs> uh, that's in the $5 a month community tier on Patreon. Yeah. That's www.patreon.com dash generally. J E N A L I N E. And Julian, J U L I A N. <laughs> www.patreon.com. Jenlene and Julian, thank you so much for your support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been Thanks wonderful. for coming to class. Thank you for coming to class and uh, sort of ending your week with yes. us. Yes. Happy Good Friday. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. We hope you have a wonderful Easter break. Yes. And we shall see you in the clubhouse <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah, it's Sunday, not Saturday. If you go to Discord, you can find the information or just send me a DM about the talk. Yeah. But we're going into clubhouse right now. So please head over into the next room into our clubhouse seminar. <laughs> see you there. Bye-bye, guys. Oh, well done. That was such a good class, Jillian. Uh -huh.